1 John uh, chapter 2, starting in verse 18, where Mike just read. That's where we'll be anchored all morning today. And as we start our study, uh, I want to take us back to, to last week, so Monday, May 6th, and Monday, uh, or Tuesday, May 7th. Uh, on that day, I was able to join this group of pastors and leaders from the from the denomination uh, in Chicago for the third of three discipleship and church planning opportunities that we've been able to take place in. And if you could see me all the way at the end of the table, if you had the look on my face, I look a little rough. Look like I had a rough night the night before. And that was because this was a really quick trip. We left early Monday morning and came back. I got home about 4 a.m. Wednesday morning. We flew in and out of Philadelphia Airport and Chicago O'Hare. The, the flight out on Monday went great. We had no delays, really no no issues whatsoever, but the flight home on Tuesday night, because of tremendous thunderstorms that were going through the Midwest, flights were all messed up. We got to the airport in Chicago about two hours before our scheduled flight. When we got through security, what we saw was just shy of chaos. Flights were delays, gates were being changed, so people were in literal sprints running from this gate to this gate, trying to catch their flight, trying to figure out what's going on. Every seat in the airport was full because no one's flight was going out, right? So no one was leaving, everyone was delayed, so there was no place to really take a seat and a rest. Restaurants had long lines of people waiting to get in. It was kind of chaotic. People were everywhere, scrambling and helpless, trying to find their way to wherever they wanted to go. We got really pretty lucky because our flight was only delayed about an hour and a half, but it was kind of funny as we were waiting in that delay, sitting at our gate, an announcement came over the speaker saying, that were preparing to board our flight to Philadelphia. And then they said, and they did this in a very positive tone, they said, we're, we're ready to board, we're just re waiting on our plane to taxi to the gate and the crew to get here. <laughs> so, so basically, we're just waiting on the plane and someone to fly it. So we laughed because it was very positive. The, the lady on the speaker did a great job of keeping a positive tone, but we were just waiting for the, the most essential things, everything you need to fly home. And I think about those images of chaos, of people running here and there, some just sitting, waiting pretty helplessly, hoping for their way to get wherever they wanted to go, because I think about that, and in relation to, to our study and our passage today, in relation to our world today, because our world looks pretty chaotic and helpless oftentimes, much like uh, uh, the Chicago airport did on that night. Here again, John writes in verse number 18, he writes, and, and we can think of those images of chaos in our mind, that helpless world trying to find their way somewhere. You can have those images running in your mind as we read these words of John again. In verse 18, he says, Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know that it is the last hour. And so keep in mind that John writes these words no more than 60 years after Christ's resurrection and ascension. He writes these words to the church at, as it is at the end of only generation one of his existence. And yet think about what John writes. He says, this is the last hour. Dear children, the Antichrist has come. There are many more coming. And this is, in fact, how we know that it is the last hour. And so verse number 18 of 1 John chapter 2, I think it does two things. First, it raises a lot of questions that we'll seek to answer this morning. What does it mean that we are in the last hour? That we were in the last hour 2,000 years ago? What is, who is an antichrist? How can we identify one? Because John says there's, there's been many and there are more to come. But also, it gives us a picture of, of our world, our picture of our world and why it is so crazy, why it is so chaotic, why are there are so many people aimlessly and, and hopelessly looking to find their way to somewhere, find their way home. And the answer to that, John says, is because we are in the last hour, because we are in the final days. But what does that actually mean? So today we have Two main questions that we're seeking to answer from our test. What does it mean that we're in the last days? That will be first. And then who is an antichrist? How can we identify one so that we avoid their, their false teaching and belief? First, the question, what, 
does it mean to be in the last day? Because again, John and other New Testament writers, he's not alone in this. See 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul writes about it here. 2 Peter chapter 3, where Peter writes about it. God's word has been saying for, for 2,000 years now that we're in the final days, the last days. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that Jesus is coming today or tomorrow, although he might. But it means that we are in the last era before Christ's return. Think about the Old Testament period in that B.C. period before Christ came. Whether they knew it or not, they had an entire era awaiting and coming after their era. They were in the era waiting for the Messiah, waiting for Jesus, waiting for God to send his Messiah to earth. And of course, we know that in their waiting, we have the the ability of, of hindsight, we know that in their waiting for the unknown, that caused a lot of confusion and a lot of delusion when it came to, to who the Messiah was, to where he would come from, and, and ultimately what the Messiah would do when he came. But that is no longer the era that we live in. God has sent his son. God has sent his Messiah. God has sent his light into the world. God has sent his perfect image bearer, our new Adam, his sacrificial lamb for our sin, and he has done that to save the world, and he's done that for the entire world to see. Jesus the Christ, God's Messiah, at his first coming, he came into the world as a sacrificial lamb for the sins of the world. He came as a humble servant, born in Bethlehem's manger of a, of a virgin named Mary. He was conceived in, in a human womb, in Mary's womb, but, but not by a man, but by the Holy Spirit, meaning he was fully God and fully man. He then lived 30 years in, in obscurity as a, as a carpenter facing the same human temptations and weaknesses that we still face to this day. He gave his final three years of his life of perfecting what it means to love God and love others, to actually and very specifically teaching and, and telling the world, showing the world what it means to, to love God and love others with, without the infestation of sin. He perfected that love of God and, and love of others by wholly following God's will, laying down his life upon the cross. Again, as that sacrificial lamb that takes away our punishment for our sin, God the Father proved that Jesus was who he says that he was, that he did all that was required for Christ's sacrifice for our sins to be accepted by raising him to life again on the third day. Then after that, Jesus lived for for 30 days in the flesh, proving that he was in fact in the flesh and alive, teaching the first generation what his resurrection meant for them and, and all those after them, what it meant to, to live in the last days waiting for Christ's second return. Then on Ascension Day, which was celebrated last Thursday when all the Amish businesses around were closed, he was taken back up to heaven and now we await for some 2,000 years the day when he will return and he will judge the living and the dead. But make no mistake, and, and be clear and make sure we understand this, when Jesus returns for a second time, he's not coming in the same manner or fashion or for the same role. He's not coming as a sacrificial lamb. Rather, when he returns, he's going to return as that roaring lion of Judah that we will sing about in our closing song. He's returning to set all things right. He's returning to conquer his foes, to, to weed out all sin and bring under his righteous judgment any that rebel and continue in rebellion against him, any and all antichrists, including the chief antichrist, Satan himself, will be brought under his dominion. Remember the words of one of the elders in Revelation chapter 4 to John when he says, Do not weep. See that the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he has triumphed. He is able to open the scrolls and it's seven seals. Open the seven seals in the scroll, meaning he alone is able. Not John, not Paul, not, not Peter, not David, not Moses, not Joshua, not you or I. He alone is worthy and able to open the scroll that has the name of those who have had faith in, th uh, through the, Jesus Christ and his resurrection, the sacrificial lamb that he is, thus having their sins forgiven and their lives made new. New lives that, that now get to spend their eternity forgetting what it even means to, to weep because they no longer have anything to weep over. Because they lack for nothing. They, they hurt for nothing. They groan for nothing. Because all they know now in these days, in those days to come, is the, the goodness of God. But in these days, in these last days, we with all the creation groan 
waiting for the return of Jesus, waiting in these last days for him to come and make all things right. We groan with the creation, waiting for Christ, including you and I, to make all things new. We mourn over the losses of sin, yet we as followers, we do not mourn without hope. We mourn with hope, and that hope is Jesus. That at the end of these last days, he will come triumphantly and restoratively. And so our hope as believers, as we are so often, is not as we are so often confused. Our hope is not knowing when these last days will be over. But our hope is knowing that these last days will one day be over. That we know who and how they will end. That they will end when Jesus the Christ, the one born in Nazareth as a human, yet born by the power of God, will come and make all things as they should be. So the answer to the question of what it means that we are in the last days is that we are in that, that final era. That final waiting period before Christ's final return to make things all finally and wholly good, right, and as they should be. But what is the application of that answer in reality today? It it means that as we live in these last days, we should live and have a sense sense of urgency. Because tomorrow is is truly not promised. Even the end of my sermon, as great as it is, is not promised, right? Actually, I thought the best sermon illustration for what we were talking about would be if Christ would step in and just come home right now and take us home mid-sermon. Doesn't seem like he's going to it right at this second, but that would pr- finally and wholly prove the truth of his gospel. Our lives of faith in Jesus Christ, why the New Testament from its very beginning in the book of Acts to its last words in the book of Revelation speaks so much about our being in the last days is so that we as Christ's followers and, and his witnesses ditch the world and its, its sense of complacency or or our ability in, in our sin to settle for just enough or our version of good enough, and we forsake that and take on a Christ-like urgency. That, that the, the reality of the fact that those on our list of seven of the individuals that we pray for, that those on our hearts that we are praying for to come to know and follow Jesus, that their tomorrow to do that is, is not promised. The life of faith, how we live well in these last days in life and on mission with Jesus is with a Christ-like urgency, a Christ-like urgency of, of loving God and loving others. And so John, from, from verse 19 forward, he shows us that a, that a huge part, that an important reality of our life of faith in these last days is determining who it is or, or even what it is that could potentially lead us astray that could potentially lead us astray from the firm foundation of the gospel of Christ and our urgency that we should have in Christ. And that leads us into our second question, which who is an antichrist? For John and and for New Testament writers, an antichrist is anyone who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is, as we just spoke about, he, as we have spoken about throughout this series, that Jesus is incarnated. What does that mean? It means that Jesus was 100% man because he was born of woman, but he was, he was born of flesh, he was born of blood, and all that it means, he's faced all that it means, just like you and I, to be born of flesh and be human. But simultaneously, and unlike us, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, meaning he was simultaneously 100% God. He was, in fact, truly the God-man. Not as many heretics, as, as many of the Gnostic heretics of John's day would, would proclaim and, and make themselves to be antichrist by saying that, that Jesus was human, but not divine. But yeah, that maybe Jesus was, had some sort of special and unique divinity and power come upon him at his baptism, but he himself was not divine. He's human. And so what antichrist, they, they don't deny that Jesus existed, that he was a person, but they deny that Jesus was God, that he was divine. They deny that, that Jesus is who he is, which is the Christ. Remember, Christ is, is not Jesus' last name. Rather, it is, his, it is t- his title. It is who he is. He is Jesus of Nazareth. He was adopted as Joseph's son, but he is Jesus the Christ. He is the one who maintains all power and authority, just as the Father in heaven maintains all power and authority. 
So an antichrist is anyone who in any way denies that Jesus is the Christ, that he is fully God and fully man. And then John, he gives us seven specific ways that we can spot and most importantly avoid the false, uh, false teachings of an antichrist. That, that as John puts it, that we can avoid being led astray by their false teaching and their wrong belief. First thing that we need to know about antichrist is we need to understand that they are they, that they are many. So often we make the antichrist that, that, that he or she is that person, that one really terrible person that, that we need to be on the watch and, and look out for. And yes, the book of Revelation does point to, to Satan's final antichrist coming, but that's not the one John's concerned about. That's not the one Paul's concerned about. Why? Because Jesus has that one under his control. But rather, we need to be on the lookout for, for little antichrists that, that snake our way into their, our lives. The scary thing about what John writes today is that these antichrists that he writes to combat, they, they went out from among the church. He says they went out from among us, meaning fellow believers, meaning they were once a part of their very gatherings. The Gnostic, the, the heretics of John's day were able to infiltrate the church and, and so many lives of faith because they were from their own number. They left their number, but that place that they had in the lives of so many in the church clearly led many astray, and clearly John is concerned, hence why he's writing this letter about more being led astray by their false belief and heresy. So often we look to the world of, of newspaper, newsmakers and politics for Antichrist, but what we really need to be on guard for is those in the church who would deny that Jesus is the Christ. Any that would deny the simple but absolutely essential truths, fundamental truths of his gospel and of his person, which we proclaimed anew and again this morning. We have to understand that antichrists are not just bad people that do bad things, but they do the worst thing that you can do, which is deny that Jesus Christ is Jesus the Christ, that his gospel is as simple as grace and by faith. Antichrists are many. They are they, and they often find their root not outside of the church, but, but from the inside of the church. And then verse number 19, John reminds us that they have nothing in common with, with genuine followers of Jesus. John says they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them actually belonged to us. So the Antichrist, the, the Gnostic heretics of John's day, they were once in the church, but they were never really in Christ. John says they were once here with us physically, but they were never really with us. And Antichrist, those who are without Christ and thus against Christ, they will always prove themselves to be just that, to be without Christ and thus against Christ. And so what we can do is we can look for the fruit. We can look for the, the commonality or the lack thereof in comparison with Jesus. This is simple to understand. Those in Christ, those truly seeking to know and follow Christ, they will bear Christ-like fruit. It's springtime, and if you are planting any type of fruit-bearing tree or plant, uh, ultimately you know that, it, that an apple tree is an apple tree, not because of that tag that's in the pot from the greenhouse, but you ultimately know that what you have is an apple tree when it bears an apple. You know, a tomato plant is in fact a tomato plant when a bloom turns into a tomato. You can positively know that you are in Christ and see that some teacher or someone that, that, that you are worried about being someone leading you away from Christ, you can know that they are in Christ if they are blooming Christ-like fruit. Negatively, you can test an antichrist for Christ-like fruit. Does the fruit of their lives point to and does it look like Jesus? Because an antichrist, they will ultimately separate themselves from a true follower of Jesus. And here again, they will clearly, as they do that separation, what will ultimately separate them is their denial of the incarnation of Christ. John says in verse 22, who is the liar? In other words, who is this person? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. So often we think of, of, of antichrist and the end times as things that are somehow going to, to just sneak up on us. But let's be, let's be clear. The Bible is clear that we need to be alert for these things, but not necessarily because they're hard 
to identify, but that, so that we can identify them as the Bible clearly lays them out and not be led astray by them. If someone denies any part of the truth of Jesus Christ, remember the incarnation is the reality that Jesus was fully God and fully man. If anyone denies any part of that, they have identified themselves for, for what they are. They are against the truth that is Jesus the Christ. Ultimately, that's not hard to identify, but it's, but it's easy to be led astray by if you're not alert to it. If you're not saturating your life with God's word, if you're not saturating your life with teachers who are saturating their teaching with God's word, it can be easy to let astray even by this clear denial of the truth of Jesus Christ that is at the core of our salvation. We always often talk about America being a Christian nation, but, but we have to understand that, that one of our nation's founders, Thomas Jefferson, he had his own version of the Bible. He took out the things that he thought were possible and the things that he, he thought were impossible, he, he deleted. And so if that's not an antichrist and someone that we could be led astray by, that, that I don't know who is. One of the ways that we can be led astray is by confusing someone who does good things or a couple of nice things with someone who submits to the truth of God. Someone who actually trusted and was seeking to follow God through his son, Jesus Christ. We must be on guard that we are not led astray by any denial of the full truth of Jesus Christ. And a denial of the full truth of Jesus is ultimately a denial of God the Father. John ver continues in verse 22, who is the liar? Who is, who, it is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist denying the Father and the Son. Remember Jesus' own words in verse number 14, or in verse number 11 of chapter 14, when he says, believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. We have to understand that there is no way to God. There's no way to God the Father. There's no way to heaven except through Jesus Christ. He alone is the narrow path that leads to God. And he is the narrow path, not because he's not for all, not because he does not love all, but because he is the only way to God. He is, there is no other path that leads to God the Father. The, the Bible, God's word, could not be clearer about this. There is no other path that you can maneuver down that can lead to God the Father. It is truly through Christ alone. So when you are against Jesus, when you are without saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, you are against God, and you don't really know God the Father either. Antichrist not only deny the Son, but when they deny the Son, they, they ultimately deny the Father. And in that action, they prove, John drills down on this further in verse 23, they, verse 23, they prove that they don't know God when they can't know the Son. They can't identify the Son. Jesus, or John says, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. The easiest and clearest example of this from God's word is that of the Pharisees and the religious leaders. I mean, they, we talk about it. They knew a lot. They knew a great deal about God the Father. They even had an urgency for God. It was a misguided urgency for God, but they did have an urgency. But they proved that they were misguided and that they did not really know God by not knowing his son. They proved that they did not understand and know God when they could not identify God standing before them. In our con context, Julie and I, many Sundays, will go home to Jehovah's Witnesses combing our neighborhood or a pamphlet on our door. Now give them credit, they, they have an urgency that they think is for God. They have an urgency that, that we could use more of in God's church, but in their denial of Jesus Christ, they're proved, they, they prove that their urgency is, is un, unfounded. They prove that their urgency is, is not actually for God the Father through their denial of God's Son. And there are many examples of, of religions like them. Urgent, and they think they're urgent for God the Father, but they're actually, they're not, because they are not urgent or an and on fire for God the Son. And they are antichrist, and they prove themselves to be liars and deceivers through their own words and actions, John says. Verse 26, I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. Now, I could, I could see how it could be easy and how it is easy to be led down the path 
of false belief. For the Gnostics of John's day and the, the heretics of our day, they declare that they have a special knowledge of God that others, even the apostles like John and Peter themselves, do not possess. For Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and other false religions like them, they believe that they have a special knowledge that even Christ's apostles themselves did not forget possess. And what does hearing that and thinking that do? That feeds our pride. We are all, every one of us, we are a sinful and a prideful people. And deep down, we all want to control God, right? We, we think and we hear that there's a special knowledge or that gives us some sense of control. The opportunity that Jefferson took to pick and choose what is possible and what is not possible. When opportunities come like that, it feeds our pride and ultimately it can lead us astray. It can, and if we allow it, it will lead us away from the truth of Jesus Christ. There is no special knowledge needed. All that we need for eternal life and the life of faith, it is right here. It is right here in God's clear word. There's no more needed, and there's nothing that needs to be subtracted. And so that's an important truth to hold on to because John writes in verse number 27 that, that Antichrist, another thing that they attempt to do is add to God's word and God's revelation, his revealing of himself through his son. John says, as for you, the anointing you receive from Christ remains in you and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and as that anointing is real and not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, also remain in him. Now, this is a verse that has been misunderstood, maligned, and misinterpreted, and misinterpreted. What John is clearly not saying is that we have no need for teachers, that we have no need for preachers or God's word-centered, Holy Spirit-led teachers in the church. How do we know that? Because John himself was a God's word-centered, Holy Spirit-inspired teacher in the church. The New Testament, inspired by the Holy Spirit, lays out at multiple points the roles of Spirit-led and God's Word-centered teachers. But again, remember and think deeply about what the Gnostics based their belief in. That they had a special knowledge of God, special knowledge needed for salvation. Kind of like the guy in the corner, in the alley, trying to get you to come see this special thing that he has for sale. False teachers, antichrist, whisper in our itching ears, yeah, Jesus, that Jesus stuff is nice, but, but here is what you really need to know. And again, we prove it with our fascination with things like the lost books of the Bible. We long for control of our eternity. We long to, to put God in our image. We, when we hear grace by faith and how that's for everyone in our sinfulness, we could think, well, I there needs to be more than that, right? There has to be something I can do, some special knowledge discovered, maybe in the, the dark corners of, of false teaching with roots and liars and deceiving. That's how it can sound appealing. We want, we sinfully desire God in his salvation to be under control. We want to be able to say clearly that it's because I did this or because I know this that I am just saved. I discovered this now this is, I discovered this that only a few others have discovered, and thus I am saved. But friends, the truth is, and it is here that we will get to the big idea that God's word has for us this morning. The truth is, in God's Son and in God's word, through the leading of the Holy Spirit, we have all we need for eternal life, and we have all we need for the life of faith. In God's word, in God's Son, through the Holy Spirit, we have all we need for eternal life, and for this life. The Apostle Paul writes this in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3. He says to the young Timothy, mark this down. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. They'll be ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They'll have a form of godliness, but they'll deny God's power. Friends in Christ, we need to be alert to this, but we do not need to be afraid to, of this. We need to be on guard, watching ourselves that we are not, watching the flock that is around us, that they are not being led astray by false teachers and, and antichrist. 
we do not have to live our life in fear. John and Paul and, and John and, and Peter, they, they make it clear that, that they will, false teachers, antichrist, make their folly, their false belief clear to you and everyone. That's a long list of things that we see across our world and our lives. So if we stick to the truth of God's word and our blessed assurance in God's son, if we stick to that firm, rock-solid foundation, we do not have to live in fear, but we should live our lives alert to the falsities of this world. And so let me leave us with three things to take with us and cherish and apply to our lives in Christ in these last days. First, rest assured that you know or that you can know God the Father through God's Son. Friends, truly, there is no special knowledge or special thing that you have to do or discover to earn the salvation in Christ. If you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, if you confess Jesus Christ as Lord, you do or you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your sins are forgiven and that you have a new and eternal life. You know that, that the God of the universe and that through the sacrifice and work of his son, you are now a son or daughter of God. You don't have to guess or hope at this. Rather, you can truly know this. That is the blessed assurance that we sang about this morning. You can rest assured in that. You can know that no matter how these last days go, no matter how long these last days continue on that it is the grace of the lord jesus christ it is by that alone by which you are saved and that is truly a blessed assurance so rest assured in that but also keep in mind be alert that god's children will live like god's son remember an apple tree a tomato plant they don't prove themselves to be an apple tree or a tomato plant until they bear an apple or a tomato just as followers of Jesus don't, don't prove themselves, don't prove ourselves to be followers of Jesus until we follow Jesus, until our lives begin to bear Jesus-like fruit. Paul says, all these things, these will be the fruit of the lives of those unbelievers and those working and living in rebellion against Christ. But then what does he say? Have nothing to do with these things. Have nothing to do with these people. Not cut sinners, as we talked about last week, completely out of your life, but don't live your life as they live their lives. Have nothing to do with your ways. Don't separate yourselves from them physically, but separate yourself through the actions of your life. Don't separate yourself out of the pride of your place in Christ, but, but separate yourself from the world through your thoughts and actions, knowing that one day Christ will ultimately and fully separate you from the world and from sin that one day all that plagues this world and as we see in our prayer request that oh, there is a lot and there is many awful things that plague our world but one day all of that will be wiped away and all we will know is god's goodness the goodness of his son that will be one day we have that promise but our invitation today is to start to bear that fruit today is to start to live like god's son now and bear his fruit in this dark world today so as you do that keep in mind as you follow christ keep in mind that a child of god will bear god-like fruit and be alert god's teachers will teach god's word a teacher from god and of god they will be rooted in no other place than in god's word Right? They will not have, there have not been, there will not be any new revelations from God. There are no lost books of the Bible, and there is nothing greater, nothing more that needs to be added, nothing that should be subtracted from God's word. It stands alone. It is the final authority of our faith. If a teacher really is of God and from God, they will be rooted in this text. They'll be tethered to no other place. They'll, they'll feed you nothing but the fire hydrant of God's word. God's word that is sufficient for this life and sufficient for the next life. So be alert to that reality. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you for the truth of your word this morning. We thank you that even on this day, as you give us a clear example of what we're walking through as a church and what many of our 
brothers and sisters and loved ones are walking through hard, difficult things, things like cancer diagnosis, losses of life, Lord. As we walk through this world and all the things that tug at our hearts, Lord, I thank you that we can have the assurance to rest in the hope that we have in your son, Jesus Christ, that there is nothing hidden from us. There's no special knowledge. There's no special task that we need to complete. But what we need to know is that it is by the grace and it is through our faith in your son, Jesus Christ. It is through that alone by which we are saved. And so we thank you for that reality and we ask that that reality would be written afresh and anew and in a deeper sense in our lives and upon our hearts, Lord. And that from that, we would be able to weave through any things that lead to something other than your son, be able to determine the people that we truly can follow and imitate as they follow your son, and then be able to weed out and turn away from the example of those that, that are pointing somewhere else, that are leading away and only feeding into to our pride and our sinfulness, Lord. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name, and we pray that the fruit of these things would be seen for the world that is around us, that we would separate ourselves in a Christ-like way, and as Christ drew the world, and even the most hardened sinners to himself through his kindness and his mercy, that we would be able to, as Peckway Church and as individual believers, draw the same lost world to your same marvelous son. It's in his name that we pray. From one Sunday to the next, our lives can change.